Thank you, Mariah. So welcome everybody to the session, Simplify Development of SAP Fiori Apps with the Data V4. So my name is Christian Kolbowski. I'm a development architect in the area of user experience engineering at SAP. There I'm part of the Fiori Elements team. Um, with me, I've got my colleague, Stefan Engelhardt, who will support me in the workshop and also supporting giving an answer to your questions. Uh, before we dive into the exercises, so I will walk through the exercises and talk about what is actually happening on the screen. But before we do that, I would give a short uh, overview introduction on SAP Fiori elements um, for the participants amongst you who are new to the topic. <clears throat> so this is about now giving an overview as said, yeah. So SAP Fiori elements and SAP Fiori tools are actually what SAP uses to build apps for SAP S4 HANA. So, and the approach allows to build apps that perform well, look consistent to each other and are efficient to develop. So um, we uh, follow with SAP Fiori elements, a template and metadata based approach. So uh, the provided templates uh, reduce the amount of front-end development required to create your application, which raises uh, developer productivity. So you can really focus on your backend log logic uh, uh, to bring also the UI forward. Yeah, and this automatically leverages our proven UI concepts. <clears throat> so, um, we have automatically UX consistency since the templates are developed and maintained by SAP. And you get the same user experience consistency we ship with our standard Fiori apps. Um, with it comes that all the updates uh, we, uh, we ship, so you'll get all the up UI updates automatically, yeah? so that your Fiori apps also comply to the latest SAP Fiori standards. Um, we have enterprise readiness out of the box. Yeah, so we have enterprise great features built in. Yeah, and yeah, with it ensuring um, high quality and stable optimized UI code. So let's talk a bit more about developer productivity and how it is boosted by providing templates. We call them page types. Most scenarios in the enterprise involve a variation of providing an overview on business relevant data and managing the data. The SAP Fiori elements page types were developed to cover the majority of these use cases. We provide five distinct page types so we have the overview pages, which are used to provide an overview on the data for a certain business area or role. This um, overview page is usually the jump off point for a business process. The most common used uh, page type is the list report. So with list report pages, you can work with the large set of items in a list format. Uh, you can filter and sort on the results and drill down to an object page for more information. For list report, we have two variations. Uh, we have the analytical list page that adds analytics capabilities and the ability to add charts to illustrate your data. And we have the work list page that allows you process a list of tasks. So with SAP Fiori Elements, we provide UI logic out of the box asset. There's simple logic such as navigation between pages or between apps or searching, sorting and filtering capabilities in lists. But we also have more complex functionality like for example, editing, including draft management, which is um, the technology of choice for transactional behavior in the browser. Um, 
you see here also some of the enterprise readiness features that I mentioned before, which automatically come with each of the provided page types. So I mentioned um, the metadata based approach. So OData allows you to annotate the services metadata. And by adding these annotations, you define the semantics uh, describing exactly how the data is to be interpreted. For example, defining that a currency pro property uh, belongs to the amount to be shown on the UI and also in edit mode uh, shown correspondingly. <clears throat> But we also uh, define with annotations the behavior of the UI. So the mentioned um, editing capabilities, but also things like whether a business, uh, uh, um, for example, the actions that a user can, can execute and also giving hints about consumption. Yeah. So where on the UI can I click to put it so? So, SAP Fiori elements starting off with Odata v2 a couple of years ago now also supports Odata v4. So what is it all about? Um, so with Odata v4, you get an ISO approved OASIS standard and uh, you have the technology of choice for enterprise applications. SAP Fiori elements leverages the advantages of Odata v4 while keeping the patterns and layout stable and consistent with the latest SAP Fiori user experience. With SAP Fiori elements floor plans for Odata v4, uh, we currently support page types, list report and object page. And we already provide initial support for the existing overview page. And we also support um, extensions with the ability to inject custom code. We call this uh, the flexible programming model. And you'll get, um, you'll get more details on that uh, in the course of the exercises. <clears throat> Way forward, we plan to deliver more and more support for data before in a phased approach. So adding the remaining page types and also adding additional features in the flexible programming model. So Primar primarily, I want to mention here the introduction of SAP Fiori Elements building blocks. So the very same building blocks our framework is using in order to, to um, template the UIs will be made available so that you can also include them in, in uh, extensions and also leverage uh, all the semantic um, capabilities uh, that come with uh, these building blocks. Um, and of course, more data for advantages are, for example, the built in analytics capabilities. So we have dollar apply, apply for aggregation, we can define your uh, transform or custom aggregates, and things like deep expand deep insert uh, are Odata v4 only features to mention a couple of, of them. <clears throat> From a backend perspective, um, you can use the cloud application programming model, CUP, or Steampunk to build an Odata v4 ser service. For the on-premise world to support for creating Odata v4 services with the RESTful application programming model, is planned to be released soon. In order to decide whether you to use Fury Elements for data v2 or v4, I will give you the opportunity to make yourself familiar with the solid feature set Fury Elements floor plans for data v4 already provides in the course of the exercises. Let's talk a bit more about development experience. So you can now develop SAP Fiori apps with the help of the brand new SAP Fiori tools. So the SAP Fiori tools extensions are provided as a plugin to your development environment. And you have two options here. If you opt for the SAP hosted integrated development environment named SAP Business App Application Studio, the tools are pre-installed. 
So you just create your development space and you're ready to go. So this has the advantage, of course, it's you do not have to install or configure anything on your machine. <clears throat> but many developers like to use their development environments and customize them with their favorites, tools, and ex extensions. And for this reason, SAP Fury tools are also available as an extension for Visual Studio Code. And you get a very same experience. So to summarize this, um, I want you to remember three main themes yeah, from this presentation. So the first is SAP Fury elements and SAP Fury tools greatly accelerate and simplify app development. Second, SAP Fury elements enforces UX consistency. So meaning every app you build using this framework will look and behave the same, which ultimately results in less user tra training, of course. And finally, we found at SAP that around 80% of apps we create can be implemented with SAP Fury elements. So that was the overview part. Do we have any questions up to here? Yes, Christian. And uh, so Raghu is asking, what is the main difference between Odata v2 and Odata v4 versions? Maybe we can um, um, tell this in, in a nutshell. Sure. If you like, you can also take the, the question, Stefan. I was talking about. <laughs> for 10 minutes. So just if you like. And do, do, you, do you have the, um, this uh, comparison slide deck uh, at hand? <clears throat> sure. Uh, um, no, okay, but I, I can take the, the question if you like. So basically uh, with Odata v4, um, so let's talk about a bit the differences we have and the advantages. So with Odata v4, um, you get a more loose coupled, more modular ap approach how you can create an Odata v4 service. So um, you have the possibility to loose car couple different um, service entities together and expose them as a, as a new service. So this is the, the, the modular approach. Furthermore, you have a reduced size of the um, of the, the metadata, which ultimately results in a better perform performance. Um, the metadata is also JSON based and the query language itself has, has, has been much more simplified compared to Odata V2. And as already said, uh, if you go for uh, analytics capabilities before it was, um, it was uh, rather a bigger effort to, to do so. Yeah. So now you, with Odata before, you have a huge set of analytics capabilities, which are built into the Odata protocol itself, meaning that you can formulate an analytical query in the Odata query and uh, gather the results to be shown, for example, in a chart on the UI. So, um, these were some of the advantages. Um, as said, also, if you're working with hierarchical documents, uh, like, uh, for example, a sales order, you have usually header, item, schedule line. And before, uh, in order to do inserts on each of these le levels, um, this was rather a complex um, query. You need it with Odata V2, with Odata V4. As said, in the future, we will also provide this from the Fury element side. You can uh, leverage the deep insert uh, capabilities we have, means providing a payload that reflects the hierarchy of a document and inserting it with a single call. So these are. Stefan, if you yeah, like to add some of the advantages or aspects. Um, no, I think you nicely uh, explained it. So, <laughs> um, so the next question um, is from Pedro. So how do you see the overall lack of adoption and disinvestment in Odata in the business world, not including SAP and Microsoft? Yeah, I mean, um, so, so, so GraphQL is, of course, um, one of the, um, yeah, um, of, of the protocols, which is very popular at the moment. I mean, as you can imagine, so there are already thousands of apps built 
um, using or data, so you cannot easily um, 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 change them. Also, frameworks got built, and I mean, OData has um, um, yeah, it, it has um, very similar um, benefits like compared to GraphQL. So yeah, I mean, let's let's see how it will go. But of course, as you can imagine, when there when there are already um, um, investments into OData, um, and so from a technology technology perspective, and many many apps are built with it. So yeah, this can of course not easily be. Um, okay. And um, uh, to Attila's mm. question, so um, um, RUP supports OData before. It uh, it already supports it on um, on. SAP Cloud Platform ABAP environment, um, and so so there you can then easily um, where you have now a V2 service binding, you can create a V4 service binding, and then you you, you can you can um, continue um, using your service. So for for the on-premise release, I would need to look up when it's available. But in um, Cloud Platform ABAP environment, you can already use it the V4 service right. binding. And then um, Melvin is asking, what is the recommended usage of the floor plans? This report navigating to an object page. Um, yeah, so usually you have, um, um, or so, so in, in general, so Christian, maybe can you go back to your floor plans page? So, so, mm -hmm. so, so in, in, in a perfect world, um, you have for your, um, for your persona, um, um, an overview page, which um, shows the most important information or the information uh, where you um, where, where, where you need to um, um, have a look at. So imagine you are a, um, 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 a purchase um, a, a purchaser and there you you want to see your contracts which are um, running out or, or, or products you need to reorder, things like this. You have everything at one place. Um, which you need to monitor. And then from there, you can navigate to either here list pages um, um, or directly to object pages. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the and list report object page. Um, so this is um, the, the majority of the Fiori Elements apps or in general, all the Fiori, also for the Fiori apps are, are um, um, leveraging this two floor plans. Yeah, that you have a list of objects and you can go into the details. Right. So then right. Can continue. Great. So then let's continue. So if there are no further questions, um, I would start with uh, uh, with the workshop. So I want to have this as interactive as possible. So if you if you have questions, you can also speak up. Uh, you can use the chat. Either Stefan picks it up, or if I have a look, uh, then we can discuss uh, things to, together. So I'll just jump out of, of the slides and then um, and then just uh, just start right off. So at first I'll bring up um, I bring up my browser. So it, everything that I will show now you you will be able to rehearse uh, in this GitHub repository. So this is the SAP samples repository where we have all the exercises described in Markdown. And furthermore, we have uh, the sample cup service. So we will be using an OData v4 service based on cloud application programming model for Node.js. This one will also be available in here. And um, you can either, either cl clone from here or you are what I would recommend is that you create your own fork in case you have a GitHub account. So you have your own personal playground where you, where you can uh, extend, enhance and track things and then push back to GitHub. So net, now let's start. So what I will be doing at first, so I would assume that most of you have a trial account, but if not, uh, I just give you a short glimpse uh, how you can get uh, such an account and from there also access the business application studio. That is the one that we will be using today. So this is all described here. So you can you can create your trial account here and then you at the point you have your trial account created, you can access your trial account via the link here. And inside, if I do this, um, I have opened it here. This is a starting page. Then you can access the SAP Business Application Studio directly. So the entitlement is already in place. So just for that. And we'll be using, I'll be using, 
I'll restart now the boss session. So, okay. Um, yeah, so I've already created a development stage. I will just start it by um, just in order to show you how, just let me put this here to the side, um, which kind of development space you should create in order to develop an app. Um, it depends on your use case. So we have the uh, SAP Fiori um, kind of profile here that already comes with uh, all the Fiori Freestyle tools. You have the Fiori tools, and this is good to go uh, in order to create an app uh, that is based on an data service uh, that is to be consumed from a remote source. For our scenario today, we will go for the profile SAP Cloud Business Application. That one comes with the core data service tools already installed and also has Fiori application and, and uh, SAP Fiori tools already in place and installed. So, and that's now what we'll do. So I've already created the dev space. I just started it. So I access it now from here. And the first thing we like to do is now to get a sample scenario. So I will just fetch the URL from the GitHub repository I had just shown before and clone and clone the sample service from Git. You see here a terminal is opened and voila, that's everything already. Now what I'm doing is opening a workspace. Yeah, so I, I cloned it and I see here that my project is already available. So I select it. So now I open the workspace and I have here in my Explorer, my um, Capsidus project in place. Let's run an NPM install so that all the package dependencies are in place. While this is running, Suragu, you, you, you saw um, when Christian um, um, selected the workspace, so there was basically the projects and then there was this one project um, um, below, and then there you could also have several projects. Referring back to this yes. question about uh, projects in workspace or projects in dev spaces. Exactly. So you can have always several dev spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, now npm install was successful. So let's uh, check on the CDS version. So we have Cup CDS 4.5.3. Now let's just start the cup service. This is done by running CDS watch. What it's doing now, it's compiling all the CDS sources and exposes um, the service on port 4004. And we can give this port a name so that if you want to open it again, we can just um, access the port previews uh, we have created. Okay, now we have here the welcome page of the SAP CDS server. We see here the service endpoint incident. So today we'll be running through an incident scenario. And I can access the metadata from here. So as you see, this is an OData version V4 service. And if I open, for example, an entity, we see that there's also data in place. So now the next thing we would do is to generate a Fiori Elements app on top of it. And for that, um, we, will be using, um, we will be using a Fiori tool. So this is the uh, Fiori app generator. You can access the app generator by uh, running a command. So we have here, if I filter for generator, we have your Fury Open Application Generator. This starts the template wizard. Let's make this a bit bigger. And um, the first thing before I do that, just let me do something. I will um, I will create a branch of my repository so that uh, we can see what Fury tools actually are doing um, when I 
add additional capabilities to my UI. So let's just restart the service again. So you see now here an effect. So this is a small bug. This is already in the making somebody the opened ports on the closed correctly, but this is already being addressed. You can just uh, open another port when restarting the service and then you're good to go. So now let's um, start right off with the Fiori app generator. So the first thing we like to choose is the page type. We go for list report object page. In this case, we have here all the pages available. Not all of them already support Odata v4, but this is a unified um, template wizard. So you can basically start from here and create an Odata v2 or Odata v4 based Fiori elements app. Let's go for list report object page. So the first thing we have to do is to select the data source. As I said, this could be coming a um, data source from an SAP system, some more data service. You can even consume a um, service from the API business hub. The option that we go for is to use a local cap node.js project. And I've talked to the colleagues, the Fury Tools colleagues, and they said, uh, support for CAP Java is in the making. So what he wants now is that I choose my um, service folder path and he automatically recognizes the OData service that is uh, served in this, in this uh, pro -pro project folder, which is incident service. Let's go for that one. So now, since we go for list report object page, we have to define a root entity that is to be used to show information on the starting page. For the main entity, we go for incidents. The navigation entity, entity will leave empty since on the object page, uh, we want to show single instances of the main entity uh, that we have selected on the list report. So now we just have to provide some additional project attributes. So the module name and the app title and a namespace. And for rehearsal of the exercises, it's important to stick to the model name and application namespace because we'll add some extensions that rely on this namespace in order to be integrated seamlessly. So we have some sample extensions um, pre prepared that can be easily in integrated. Here we could also go and add deployment configuration or FAP configuration. We skip that for now. We configure advanced options. Here you have the opportunity to, we have now also the dark style of the UI, but let's stick to, to light. And uh, what we do is also skip generation annotation CDS file because the service already comes with a prepared uh, annotation CDS file with basic annotations so that we don't have to start from scratch. But I will go through these annotations uh, after this to show you uh, what is already in place. And in one of the exercises, we'll also enhance um, them accordingly. So let's skip this for now and let's start the generation. So we see now what happened here. So um, the CDS watch has recognized automatically that changes uh, have been applied to the um, to the whole project and so everything was automatically recompiled. Um, let's see what had actually been done so far. For this, let's open the changes view. So we started with the package, JSON. Um, can I open, I want to see this. So what, what happened is, um, 
Ah, okay, okay. So we have here, okay, we have here a couple of uh, artifacts uh, that are uh, created in the app incidents folder. We go through them after this. At first, I want to show you the package JSON that had been available. So the things that App Generator has added here was a dependency to, to the UX specification. So this is actually needed by Fury tools in order to access all the Fury elements uh, typings in order to understand and, and parse, for example, the, the manifest and to uh, to put things into the, the right place. And also a dependency to uh, the path where the app had been generated in. So uh, these are the artifacts that have been added to. We have, um, we have uh, in the app incidents folder, a packet JSON, we have a component JS uh, created which basically does an extension on our um, FE core app component, so the Fury Elements Core app component. Um, there is one sandbox index, index HTML that is used in order to get a preview uh, of the UI in the sandbox mode. And of course, there's the the, the manifest, which is the, the, the most important part of uh, the, the generated artifacts. And in here, if we scroll a bit down, um, we basically see two routes. So, which is for the list report and the object page. And we see here that um, there are everything is in place basically that is needed in order to do navigation from the list report to the object page. But now let's just just have a look at the at the UI that had been generated. So let's swip, switch back to the preview. And if I refresh here, just let me expose that again. So Some hiccups, so let me just start this again. Let's see this watch. So the mentioned hiccups, so let's now wait for it to pop up, expose and open. I think I closed it accidentally before. Let's name it now. Okay, now we're back in the game. So we see here now again the welcome page. And additionally, uh, the cup service also serves the index HTML of the generated app. Let's now start it. You see we have a sandbox FLP and we have a list report and the list report already comes with some selection fields and a list. We have here a couple of columns defined, which is great. I can um, use the filters on top already in order to drill down into the data. And I can go to the object page where basically we have uh, some information shown in the header, the content area and a table below. We we'll go through the annotations that were provided already uh, that define this uh, UI. I will just also show you the transactional behavior that also is already in place. So I can switch here to edit mode. This automatically creates a draft. And if I switch here some values in the lower right corner, you will see that the draft is automatically saved. So which basically makes sure that my work is not lost if my browser session is gone. So we see here now also there's a draft indicator in place. We could also create a new draft instance. So if I, if I go completely new, let's uh, try this too, give it an identifier. Just to give you an idea. 
So and then I can also create this draft and I have an object created, which is also now, if I go back and refresh, I have here my newly created draft available. So let's now have a look at the already existing annotations um, that mark responsible for the layout of the UI that we already see. So in the app folder that was already in place, we have one file that's called annotation CDS. And that one basically has a basic set of annotations uh, that are used. So we are for the table definition on the list report, we have this line item annotation collection, which is a collection of data fields. And each data field basically points to a property of this um, of this root entity of my cap service, which is incidence. And like this, we, for example, already define the, the, the columns to be shown in the, in the table. We even have one column that has a, cri a, a criticality ca column shown. So criticality, if we switch back is, uh, we see the priority, for example, here highlighted in a certain ca 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 color, which is achieved by providing information about the criticality additionally. We also have seen that there are also selection fields in place. So selection fields come into this by defining in the same annotation of the service incident, simply some of these codes yeah, in this selection field collection. In this case, we are using a speciality of cap. Um, so usually we need a value list annotation to be defined, but in case of a managed association, which means I have an association for my root uh, entity incidents to just show, show you that to my um, entity's priority care category and star status, we automatically get um, we automatically get a denormalized representation of these um, associated entities by having these additional pro properties now in the root entity and cup additionally auto generates the value list an annotation. So that is the reason why we get um, the value list for, for free in this example. We could also go and say we create a value list annotation manually, which would then basically give more for item. So we can also see the value list annotation in the metadata. If I search, for example, for category code, and then skip a bit down, then we see here this annotation. So this is the annotation of my property category code of my root entity incidents. And we use this property for a selection field. And it comes with a value list an annotation already in place. And the value list an annotation in this case is a fixed, is of type fixed, which means that you basically get this um, a drop down and in the drop down all the the values are being sh sh shown and the values are retrieved um, from the um, from a collection path in this example the collection path is the other entity category so if we select the category entity we see that this is the one that basically provides the values for the value list so these were selection field and the line item annotation on the object page. We have some basic information shown too. We have this um, header section shown that shows an icon and three, pro three properties. This one is defined by simply giving, um, by simply defining this header facet. 
annotation as you call it. So we are still in the annotation block of my root entity incidents. And my header facet annotation points to a so-called field group. A field group is a collection of data fields. We see that header general information field group def defined below. And basically, again, here we have basically just have two data fields which point to properties of my root entity, which are title and description in this case. And these are the ones that uh, just, um, no, I here, yeah, okay, I, I mix up. So, header general information field group defines priority code, incident status code, and category code, which are the ones that we see here. So, if we select another one, then we see they're properly filled. The same goes for the content section. So, let's quickly go through this so that we see what we already what we have. We have other um, field groups defined. So we have this general information field group. And then for the content part of the object page, there is this facets collection. Facets is the umbrella of all the um, sections that we show in this area of the object page. And basically it's again, the same schema. Here we call we make a collection of two reference facets that again point to a certain field group and the field group defines a set of fields. So that is the way how you can group and, and define information to be shown on the object page. Below this um, section here, we have another table that shows data from another entity. This is um, pros flow information. So if we let me just close this here. If you skip back, so we have here another another entity that's called incident flow, which holds additional information, and we have an association from our root entity incidents to that table, um, and basically we can then just go and define another reference facet that then points not to a field group but just points to another line item annotation definition via following the association path. So which is in this case, incident flow. So the name of the navigation property, and then at the target of this navigation property, we refer to the line item annotation in there and the definition of that one we can see below. So here we have another annotation. We annotate basically the target entity incident flow and in there define again a couple of data field and so that is it. So that, that is the starting point. Um, what we'll do now is to enhance the UI a, a bit. So for that, um, the first thing we like to do is um, let's do something something cool so we will switch to the flexible column layout at first and for that we will be using let's just close all, all of this we'll be using another fury tool which is called the page map um, and in order to um, see what is happening let me just uh, open another terminal i always like to show you what the tools are doing So now we have everything added and let me just commit this quickly. So, and then just, um, okay. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, it's not allowing this. Okay, but then I'm at least in the stage changes. Okay, now let's just use another Fury tool. So, I was talking about the page map. You can access the page map by clicking right on the app folder and then just clicking show page map. And this will bring up uh, the tool. And uh, the, the layout of the page map is basically, you see all your pages defined and then the navigation between them. Each of the tiles here show the leading entity you are using. 
and uh, to the the right side so we'll dive into that afterwards to the right side there is a global page settings section where we can now define the flexible column layout and before i explain what it is i will just do it so i will select a layout for two columns and the way it should expand and also a layout when we have three columns and how it should be expanded and i just apply that let's switch back to this view here um, we see that it automatically recompiles now let's have a look what happened now let's at first have a look how it looks actually i just refresh the browser So, and if I select now one item in the list, instead of navigating to the detail page, I get a split view. So this eases the navigation between items. Yeah, so I can easily skip uh, th through these and I get additionally these nice um, enter full, full screen button, which allows me to just focus on a single selected item here. I can also uh, skip back to the split view and I can also close the view. So that is basically the flexible column layout. And let's just quickly look what Fury, paid, Fury tools have applied. So for that, I open the ma ma manifest so that we can see the changes that Fury tools have automatically applied. So they were applied to the manifest of, of the app. So we have an additional dependency that is required for the routing that is um, performed by the flexible column layout. And of course, the routing itself had been enhanced additionally. We have now in each of the root targets a collection, which basically groups the pages that are to be shown yeah, in the flexible column layout view. So for the um, for the object page, yeah, for, for the, the list report is of course I see only my list report, but if I now match the root of the object page then additionally to the object page i want to see the instance uh, list yeah just defined like this and um there is also what we said um how the split should happen so this is done by applying this begin and mid column pages like this we we define what portion of the screen each of the each of the pages should take so this is basically the things that were added by uh, the the page map um yeah that was um flexible column layout now let's dive into some additional features the page map provides uh, let's just stages here so that we always can see the changes that are applied now let's do some additional configurations um, i said that we have the opportunity here to uh, to go into these so here we have a small pencil icon so at first we like to we like to configure a bit uh, the list report so and the very first thing i like to do is you might have seen is um you might have seen that um every time i enter the app i have to press the go button in order to get the data selected in order to uh, do this automized um i have here in the page editor incidents list on the table view the opportunity the option to switch initial load to two Let's have a quick look at the manifest, what happened. And we see that in the target definition of my routing, this additional flag had been added. And if I now re-enter the UI, the starting page, then <laughs> nice. Uh, of course, I need, to, uh, I need to refresh. So the metadata is again fetched. 
that's important. So the cup service reloads, but the metadata has to be fetched again. So now let's try again. So I enter and now we see that the list report automatically does the, the load of the, of the data. Stefan, you speak up if, if there are any questions because I'm, I'm focused now on the exercise. So if there are questions in the chat, you can just also interrupt me. If not, I will just continue. Okay. Yeah, I will, I will. They, they are not really okay, great. They're not fully related to what you're doing, so. <laughs> okay, so then you can, uh, okay. If you like, and of course you can also pick them up in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing we would like to do is uh, show some additional features of the page. Let's go quickly through them. Um, let's go back to incident pages. I want to show you that also on the on the properties for the list report itself. So for the whole list report, we have the option to switch the variant management uh, from page to to control or even completely disable it. Yeah. Um, be before we do that, let's see what page level variant management means. Um, so if I, if I, for example, um, select here some um, filters, I see here in the top, um, there's a small drop down, and here I have the the option to save my variant that I have selected and give it a name. And that variant actually counts for the whole page. Of course, we need UI flexibility um, enabled and, uh, and storage for it. Uh, we're here in the <laughs> sandbox, but uh, to uh, show you, we can give it a name. So my variant, and if I just save it here, then I can skip forth and back, and uh, you see that I have the variant and already always um, assigned. Now, by switching to control level variant management, we give this an additional feature. Let's just refresh the UI, so I just switched it. Now, additionally to my variant management I have here on top, I have this now also on my list report. And like this, I have the possibility, for example, if I like to reorder my, my um, columns, yeah, or, or like, for example, select additional columns, I can, I can just put this now also in a, in, a, in a table level variant that can then be selected independently from my standard um, page variant on, on top. <clears throat> So this is a nice feature. Um, again, we see here also page map just entered for this an additional entry in my, my manifest. So now let's whip, switch back to page level variant management and the assumption is that then it's again also gone. In doubt, yeah. you use mm -hmm. rather a page variant management. So, so this this was um, recognized in user tests as being um, yeah more understandable for the users. There, there can of course be um, advanced cases where you have where this um, um, control level variant management has um, um, can maybe for power users also for for complex cases also be interesting. Mm -hmm. But for the normal cases, the page variant management is probably the better one. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you, Stefan. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. So uh, this is something that makes editing on the object page a bit more beautiful. Um, if I, so let's maybe expand the full screen. If I enter edit mode on the object page um, in the default mode, as you can see, if we do it, the header fields get um, get also editable, and this is something you might want to switch off because these fields are also shown in the section below. So you basically do not want to have priority and category shown in this header section, and additionally to be editable here below. So we can switch that off by going to the page map again 
And then um, in this case, we have to go to the object page. And there, um, then on the header part, we have a property that's called editable header content. And let's just switch it to false. Wait for the recompile. Refresh to fetch the updated metadata and manifest. And if I switch now to edit mode, basically we see that the edit that the header stays as is, so it stays uh, display only, uh, which is uh, in some cases maybe more be beautiful. Now, just okay. So. Um, as you can see, so the um, options that, that you have on the page map grow more and more. So uh, you will already see when you go through the target exercises uh, and compare it to the page map that you get today, that you have already more features available that you can use with the page map. So you can just give, give it a go and try it, <clears throat> how it behaves. So, um, right. Um, yeah, so much for the page map I want to show. The next thing I want to show you is basically we will also use the page map for that, but uh, primarily this is now the mentioned flexible programming model. So we will do now some enhancements to, um, to the UI. And for this, um, at first we will add a custom page. So below that incidents flow table that we have on the object page have an additional navigation to a page that basically shows freestyle UI5 code. So let's let's do that. Um, for that purpose I have prepared some stuff you find in this test resources folder two folders one is called ext and I just uh, drag and drop that one to my web app folder of my incidents application. So let's go quickly in this X folder. Basically we have here a folder that's called view, fragment and controller for adding now this uh, custom page. We'll be adding a process flow uh, control um, view and uh, a corresponding con controller, which are defined in here. We we'll go through the code uh, in a second, but let's at first do that. And um, adding a custom page is really easy by using the, the page map. So um, the only thing you have to do is um, on the, um, the hierarchy level of your application, you like to add an additional navigation. If you hover here, then you see there's a small plus. And if I click that one, you get um, you get this uh, add page dialog offered. Basically, you have here two options. You can either um, add an object page that is more or less a hello world, or you can add a custom page. So the object page would be something that you could then again fill with uh, annotations. So in order to uh, leverage the data you have in your data model, or you can add a custom page that basically comes with its own view and controller and has automatically the context binding of the application so that you can also display the data of the underlying, underlying service. The thing that you have to define in order to, to do so is uh, your, your starting point. So the navigation from the object page to that next page has to be defined. And Fiori Tools automatically offers all the associations that uh, my entity that I have on my object page available provides. In this case, we decide for incident flow which points to my instant flow entity. Now, either we could create a new view, which would basically create a um, skeleton XML view and controller with some basic UI layout, or you can use an existing view and um, Fury tools automatically 
recognize uh, all views that are available in the ext folder of the application. And as you see here, uh, by clicking use existing view, he recognizes it recognizes the process flow. So this is the view that is defined in here. So let's just add it. Before I do that, I will again stage everything so that we can see the difference. Let's just add it. <clears throat> so what happened? We see here in the page map that an additional navigation has been added here. So hovering, I see the navigation property. And below I have my custom page with the entity that uh, is behind it and the view that, that uh, defines it. So before we have a look at the manifest uh, to see what happened and uh, in, into the code, let's just refresh the UI to see the effect. Um, I'll skip maybe yeah, to this starting page. And you remember that we defined uh, for the flexible programming model a three column layout. Now you see how this comes into play if we add additional navigation layer. We see here the incident process flow table below. And by clicking now a line here, we see here this nice uh, flow chart. And on the header of the flowchart, we have this title here. So this is of course all demo data, but to get the idea. And if I if I skip through this here, we also see that the table, which uh, the, the header here, which has actually model binding on the custom page is also updated. We also have event handlers in the controller defined. So if I click them, we see here that this is also being executed accordingly. And as said, uh, it also comes, uh, it works nicely together with the flexible programming mod model. And we even have these additional buttons here. So the custom page also has the option to do this expand collapse, collapsing, closing, to have the same user experience as for the object page. Let's just quickly see what the page map has done. Um, for this, I open the manifest and see the changes. We see here that in my routing, in the routes section, an additional route has been added. Yeah? This now matches the pattern of my selected incident follows the incident flow association property of my selected incident flow table item and um, also defines for the flexible programming model, uh, flexible, no, flexible column layout, um, the, the target collection of the pages to be shown if I open the, the custom page. Yeah, if I scroll a bit more down, I see again this initial load. Um, we see here now for the incident, so in the target section of the routing, we see here now for the incident object, object page, an additional navigation entry that, um, that um, just points then to the, to the new route that we just have seen. And then of course the navigation, the routing target of the custom page itself had been added here. And here we see that we refer to a view name and the view name is basically the, the, um, the namespace of the application um, and um, the path in the app folder structure that points to this, um, to this file, yeah. So that is why I said in the beginning in the app generator, if you rehearse, uh, if you do the rehearsal, you should stick to, you should stick to the namespace because the example process flow view um, points to points to this controller here, also and and um, yeah. So we we have this 
namespace actually as the prefix uh, in the in the whole path. Yeah, and here we see the view actually. So this is basically an an XML view um, that then just defines um, at first the, the controller asset. We can have a look at that also in a second. Um, we have here this process flow control defined and uh, the process flow in this case, you could could make usage of the OData model, but for this sample, we are using a JSON model, which is a named model. Um, we give we have given it the name process flow model. We see that in the controller in the sec and provide the data inside here. But we also see that the page title as said um, just refers refers to a property of the OData model that is exposed and that is also available as as the as the context to this to this page provided by Fiori elements. Automatic, automatically. Um, we also have some speciality here. So this is also something that has to be applied. I mentioned um, these expand collapse bug buttons on the custom page. So this has to be added to the, to the custom page view itself in order to make this uh, work appropriately. For this, I have this um, dynamic page title, heading, and the navigation actions defined. The navigation actions, as we see here, basically define these three bar buttons, uh, um, insert, full screen, exit full screen, and also close, and has the according, the according routing, routing list press handler that is defined in the controller. So the control for this process flow custom page is here. You see it's not a lot of code. Um, we have here this routing listener imported. There's a small remark, experimental usage, because officially it's not yet in the doc documentation and there might be some changes to the name. So you can use it, but you might want to observe the official documentation of uh, the SAP Fury element controller extensions, whether it's called routing or routing in the future, that is why it is marked as experimental here, but still it is already available. And basically um, we give here this routing listener that is also then being used in, in the view in order to react on the click handle for the expand collapse bar buttons that we've seen. And the, the rest of the code is uh, basically instantiating this um, local JSON process flow lanes and nodes model and just attach it, um, attach it then to the view <clears throat> in order to show the information. Right, so that was uh, adding the custom page to the, to, to the app. So let's not stop here. Let's show another feature of the flexible programming model. Um, we've now seen how we can add um, a custom page. The next thing I'd like to show you is how you can add a custom section. So custom section means that uh, if we have a look again at the object page, we have seen in the, in the beginning that we have this header, the content part and all this annotation driven information that is being shown. What we will add now is a section in this area here that is custom. So that also um, uses, uh, that also allows injection of a freestyle UF5 code, but also leverages the OData model of the of the Fiori Elements app uh, and the CUP service at the same time. For that, we will again use the page map. So we like the page map for doing so. And uh, we said we want to add this custom section at the object page. And before we do that, we again stage the changes. So we have here the option to click this um, 
little edit button. Here we can again influence all the properties, but let's just focus on the sections part here. So if I hover here, I get a small plus. And um, right, so custom section, right? Let me, yeah. So the thing that we do here, we provide a stable ID. So we want to have an ID that defines the custom section that is stable. This is <clears throat> something that we will add now. So this is actually not in the exercise, but it has been added new. So um, let's call it for example, um, my custom section. Now let's give it a title. And for that, we want to leverage um, the language model. So we could now go and say, we wanna just put a string in here, or we will be using the i18n file in order to also have this uh, uh, your language de dependent. For that at first, before I continue, I open the i18n file and just, Add another entry here. Um, the final title we want to use in my right. So you see here that I already did a rehearsal. So here offers that already. So I um, put here in curly brackets by um, putting the named language model as a prefix. I just define the, the key to the title. And um, right, so the next thing I do is um, I um, choose my frag fragment and um, I have already also prepared as I did for the custom page, I have prepared a small XML fragment as is to be used for the custom section that we find in here. And Fury Tools page map automatically recognizes this and offers it here in the dropdown. So this is already pre-selected. Um, next thing I have to define uh, the position in the object page where my custom site section is to be placed. Um, for that, I say, I want to have this after my overview facet. So this is basically the content section that I have below my header and say the position of the new section has to be after it. Let's just press add. And we already see here in the page map that an additional section has been added accordingly, uh, which has also the remark that is, is a custom section. Uh, it is also placed between the two and we will see in the manifest that it is actually so. We have here also uh, the option to navigate directly to the source code. So if I click here, then immediately my fragment is being shown. But before we dive into that, uh, let's just refresh the UI to see the effect. <clears throat> so voila, we have here now um, on the object page, the co content area now shows this nice uh, gun chart additionally. And we also see that it is depending on the lead selection that I do in the list report, we I get other information shown. So in this respect, basically fully interactive. And we also see the title that we have defined is also being shown here. <clears throat> yeah, so that is the custom section. Now let's see at first what happened in the manifest by adding so. Just close this for a second. Um, again, I have in my routing target definition of my object page. Uh, I have now an additional section that's called 
content and in the body of uh, this uh, there is my uh, there's my stable id named new section my custom section defining defining again where the xml fragment is positioned so this is again the namespace and the path to it and additionally the position where to be shown on the ui and for this we have to define an anchor asset and in this case it is the incident overview facet yeah and uh, the custom section place asset afterwards um, so the anchor is also you can also see where the anchors come from by looking again at the annotation file of your of the app so we have here the annotation cds and if i search for this anchor position i basically get the id of my uh, of my object page uh, collection facet that the groups together these field groups general information and incident detail yeah so these are this is the anchor that is actually um, used <clears throat> at this point right um any questions stefan where are we with questions not related to your not really related to what you are doing not related that's good that means that uh, everything i explain is immediately understood which is good so that is at least so maybe one thing, interpretation yeah maybe one thing to send so could yeah. you so, um, I, I did as I was um, um, answering questions. So, did did you show the um, the LSP support in the here when doing that? Will LSP? come. Okay, we will do this now. Mm -hmm. Great. We will do this now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay, this is now basically the low code, no code part of uh, of the show. So, let's now dive into enhancing enhancing the UI. Um, like developers do it uh, by adding additional annotations. So for this, uh, let's just close the other tabs and just stick now to my annotation CDS file. <clears throat> so the first thing we want to do is, so we were talking about these field groups and sections and so on. Let's add just an additional field group to the object page and show additional information in there in this existing in this existing um, group that we have here just add a, another group by making usage <clears throat> of um, the um, language server protocol support so this is also something that has been implemented by the cap cds compiler so it implements the language server pro protocol and uh, allowing auto suggests for annotations based on the odata vocabulary uh, also sensitive to the position and the context where uh, the, this is applied <clears throat> so in order to do so let's scroll a bit down and um, we have here um, Okay, let's enhance, um, I said we will enhance here, but let's just enhance the header section because here we have some additional space to be filled. So let's just enhance the header facet section. We have here this header facet collection. And what we want to do is, uh, is to define an additional field group in here. For, for this, I have the possibility to trigger now um, the LSP support, so I just press control space. And if I um, no, and then just um, say I want to have a um, I want to have a reference facet. Just just at first, let's define the field group. Um, just let me see. Let's just remove this here. <clears throat> so at first, let's define a field group. 
So as you can see, I, I triggered um, LSP support and by typing in all the annotations that can be applied at this position in, in, the, in the annotation section are offered. And if I select now field group, um, what I get is uh, is the is a skeleton of the information yeah, of of the of the annotation uh, that uh, that now can be um, that now can be completed. What I always need for a field group is I need um, a qualifier. A qualifier is added by adding this uh, hash and give it a, a name. Now I press tab and get right into the field group. And now if I trigger again the LSP support, now I get all the annotations that can be applied in here. In this case, I want to have a um, collection of data to be shown. We see here these nice brackets. Cursors is immediately placed inside. And inside the data collection, I now can go for data field or other options we also have. Yeah. We stick now to data field. And the cursor is now automatically placed behind the, the value property. I trigger again uh, the um, LSP support. And now I get as auto suggest uh, all the properties of my current entity that I am annotating. Now let's just add uh, the created add pro property. Yeah. Let's just define another data field behind that and do the very same by saying created by. Right, so now we have this field group defined, which basically defines these two properties. And now let's add this. Um, <clears throat> Let's add this now to the to the to the header facet. Yeah. Um, let's add it to the, the reference facet. So let's just scroll down. The header facet we will use afterwards, we will add a contact card. This newly defined field group we can now add to the existing reference facets that we have here. For this, I scroll down to the facets collection of my object page. And again, inside here, so after the last one, I just trigger again LSP support and just say, um, give me a record reference facet. This is then automatically added here. And to again, again, he even offers me all the field groups that I have. Yeah, so if I just now go for the one, so I, I just defined the field group admin and by selecting it and saving, the job is already done. So let's go now back to the object page and just refresh. So we have now here general information and incident details. And if I refresh now, then we see there's another section. So I forgot to give it a, a title. So we can do that, of course. Um, so we um, give the reference facet a, a title accordingly. Let's just um, trigger again. So the the label pro property and um, we could now go again for um, I18N, for example. And I'm begging the LSP colleagues that they also offer autocomplete for the I18N properties, but for now we have to enter them like this. <clears throat> Right, and just edit again to the uh, 18N properties file. Well, let's see if it's even already there. 
Ah, okay, so we have it already. So I might also spend some words on the distribution of IATN property files and best practices. So we now have this here. And if I refresh again, then we should see a title. <clears throat> so I mentioned AI18N. So we see now here the title. Basically, we have two of them. And let's talk a bit about best practices here. So we have one that is on the DB level. Uh, so the, the yeah. CDS service comes. Yes, Stefan? Before you go into the details of the IATN, yes. there's a question mm -hmm. regarding the um, annotation CDS. So there are even two very similar. Um, so is that annotation CDS imported from CDS-based or data service at project generation? What if I want to use the us feature which refreshes annotations from backend service? Is it gonna overwritten? Do I have to create in that case a local annotation file or is it actually a local annotation file already? So this is the question from Attila in the chat. Yeah. So you mean if you if you consume, so we're now here in the in the cap flavor of uh, of um, defining and exposing an OData v4 service. So we have basically the cap OData v4 service definition in the CDS files and the few elements at app on top and the LSP support. So if you consume now, a, for example, an ABAP CDS based OData service that is exposed from a back end, then of course you would need uh, either go and enhance the uh, ABAP CDS data definition, for example, via ABAP development tools, or as you already said correctly, you could define your local annotation XML file in order to redefine the exposed metadata um, and annotations that are exposed with the ABAP on-prem or um, yeah, or, or data service. Yeah. So in this example, uh, we have it all bundled together, at least for development, for deployment. We will have we have usually separate instances here, um, but but here we define annotation CDS, which is basically an isomorphic representation of the OData v4 annotation vocabulary. Uh, basically, the CDS compiler compiles it into an EDMX. Yeah, so in the EDMX is the thing that is exposed then as metadata, as we can see. Um, as we can see here, if I if I if I click here, then you get all the CDS annotations uh, compiled into EDMX shown. And uh, for the for the CUP programming model, we recommend to always stick to to the CDS based annotation modeling. Um, of course, you still can you still could uh, add in your XML based annotations, register them in a ma manifest uh, and then redefine it yeah? as you would do it if you make a remote consumption of an OData service that is deployed in some ABAP on-prem or SOHANA system. <clears throat> Does that answer the question? Let's see what Attila tells. But yes, so it, it, it at least it sounded like there was also another question. So, um, mm -hmm. do we need to have to create a lo uh, local annotation file um, for additional changes like the changes now? But I think that also goes in this direction so that you have this annotation CDS here and you just put them um, in, inside there. So, and it goes also in this best practice direction. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So Attila says. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the questions. Yeah, um, I can also quickly bring up. So, um, in order to see what I mean when I say um, Capsides is using an isomorphic representation of the Odata vo vocabulary. So, for example, if we if we have a look here, or the 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 way you can define. Uh, annotations in CAP CDS really reflects the way um, how the OData UI vocabulary is defined. So if I pull over for a second, um, the OData vocabulary UI definition. So this is basically on 
github.com, the definition of the whole UI vocabulary. If I dive now, for example, into um, line item, so the thing that we have seen before, then we see here that this is of a, of a collection. So we see these brackets, a collection of data field abstract. And you can just navigate into that and see the data field abstract collection can be a collection of data field for annotation or data field. And you can really see if you're not sure at what place you can um, add your annotations, have a look at the or data vocabulary. That is basically also what the LSP annotation support does. You could even say, uh, click into the uh, ADMX de definition and see for the line item annotation as an example where this applies. Now we see now the line item annotation, for example, applies to the entity type. Yeah, and if we have again a look at the um, definition of the line item annotation, we see here that it applies to the entity type and it is a collection of data field abstracts. And data field abstract is the overview date definition of all the UI data field annotation variations you, you can have. So this is a bit of a help for you. Um, of course, the LSP support does the job for you, but in order to grasp what, uh, the language server protocol is actually doing here. <clears throat> I, I hope that that helps. The very same is true not only for the UI annotations. You can also have for can also have a look at the <clears throat> common common annotations, um, which basically defines the common vocabulary where you make more or less the low level de defini definitions, uh, for example, text and text arrangement, field control. So um, all the things that, that define the behavior um, under the hood, they just work the, the very same way, yeah. Um, okay, so let's... Um, Let's just continue and we'll add another example. We make another example of usage of the annotation modeler. Um, for this, um, let's just in our annotation CDS file, scroll down to the definition of the annotation for the incident flow table we see. So we have here not, again, another line item collection. And now let's just add another column here and give it an additional spin by adding criticality. Um, for that, maybe at first let's have a look at the data we have. So the incident flow table, the incident flow table defines this data and we see we have a couple of properties already shown in the UI and we also have a criticality, yeah. We have a step star status and we have a criticality defined. So let's just visualize them on the UI. <clears throat> For this, I'm now again inside my line item annotation and trigger again the um, LSP auto suggest and select a data field. Um, now let's say we want to see the step status in the UI automatically offered from the properties that my incident flow entity offers in that case. And now additionally, as an additional property for my data field annotation, I want to add a criticality pro property. And that one points now to another property of my entity. So either you can, you could hard code it here. So you see here all the, um, all the, Options that criticality might take are, are offered hard coded, or you define a path. So, in that case, we choose our criticality property, which provides the information, yeah, depending on the selection we, we have, on the context we have. And um, save it and refresh. <clears throat> and then just go again to our uh, object page and refresh. <clears throat> um, 
And if I scroll down now, we see here now this additional column and we see the criticality based on the data we have in place. If you would now have a look at the UI vocabulary, you would also say that the criticality de definition, um, we could quickly do that. Yeah. So criticality, criticality. No, we could go for data field. Let's just go to the data field abstract. Um, we've chosen a data field and uh, properties for the data fields are label criticality, as you can see here. And if I go to criticality type, I see all these op options and they have a value representation. And this information is basically provided here in the OData service yeah, by pointing the criticality or property of my data field annotation to that pro property of my OData service entity, I get this effect, <clears throat> right? So uh, we need to speed up a bit. We have uh, one huge chunk left, um, which is adding a contact card. And if we have enough time, retrieve the data to be shown on the contact card from S4 HANA Cloud. So let's see. <clears throat> so in order to do so, at first um, we want to we want to enhance our existing data model with a with a with um, with an EDMX data definition that we got now from the API Hub. So let's just go to the API Hub and have a look. What we want to do is. Um, what you want to do is is to um, download API Hub API SAP.com and there we search for business partner. So the first thing you can do is uh, to define the API you like to have. In this case, you want to go for the data API of the business partner. Uh, for S4 HANA Cloud. So here in API app, you have the possibility to already play around with these, with this API, or you can download an API specification in JSON, YAML, or EDMX. And I've already done so for you because for that you need also a, a user, you need to be <laughs> logged on. And that's why I provided this EDMX for your convenience already in the, um, in the exercises. So here in our project, um, we have this API Hub folder in the test resources folder, and I have this EDMX representation. If I have, have a look, that's the one that comes from API SAP.com. And the cool thing is how to import that into a CAP project is, is to, while you have your CAP service up and running, you just drag and drop it to the SRV. And the thing that happens now is, let's close uh, all of these things here for a second. What happens is now that um, CDS has automatically imported it, generated a CSN representation, which is a reduced representation of CDS. And, um, also gives some hints how you can make usage of that. So if you scroll down up a bit in the ter terminal, we see here CDS states imported API yeah, to this path. And we can use it in our CDS model by just adding this using statement. So we just copy that. <clears throat> then go to the right place. <clears throat> So the first thing we want to do is, is our incident service CDS file. That is um, my definition file where I define my incident service entities. And now I'm uh, just adding the using statement on top. <clears throat> 
And then additionally, I'm doing this now copy paste because we need to speed up. I want to I want to expose additional entities from this um, from this um, API with my OData service. And for for that, I just add two additional projections. We see here we have now a new definition entity business partner, which is a projection on this external API definition. And we basically only take uh, the, the key and the name. And we have a second one, which goes to business partner address. And here we get uh, the keys business partner address ID and a couple of additional properties that we like to visualize in the object page header in a contact card. So, but at first let's just uh, save that for now. And um, of course, if we have now a new definition of data, we need of course also mock data. Yeah. So the whole cap programming model in a sandbox variant is in this case based on uh, CSV files, which are deployed to an SQLite instance. And we have this defined here. So we have here all the CSV files. And for this new, these new entities, uh, we like to we like also to see additional da data. And for that, I have also prepared in the data section of the test resource file, two additional files, which basically just define a couple of uh, information. So a key and a name. So this is now mock data, which you will use for development. I hope I didn't do something stupid. Error, unable to move data into data. Obviously he recognized I was doing something wrong, which is good. Okay, now what I will do is I just select the two of them and drop them into my data folder of my service definition. What should now happen automatically is that, um, see this watch has again seen that some changes had happened. And we see here that the CSV data has already been filled into our um, service, can I move this somewhere else? It's annoys me. Okay. Maybe this one too. No. Okay. Now let's see what, what happened. Let's go back to the starting page of my exposed service and refresh. So what we see now here is that we basically have now two service endpoints. Um, we have the one from my incidents. And we have the API business partner one. I could click it now. And for example, the business partner and see that my CSV data is automatically filled into the properties that are available. Since we only provided business partner and the name for this example, we see only the two of them and the rest is shown as now in this case. We have additionally exposed to additional projections in to our incident service business partner business partner address where we have defined a subset of the available pro properties somebody if i click now here on business partner address i just see um, the properties that that come that that come with the projection <clears throat> so far so good now let's continue speed up a bit um, Right, so the next thing is uh, we want to make a relation between our existing entities to the new entities. We know that on the object page, we show information from our incident service. What we wanna have now is make a relation between that incident service and uh, the new business partner entities. <clears throat> In order to do so, we enhance um, a bit our schema definition of our existing incident entity. I have here the schema DBS CDS file where I scroll down to my individual section. Yeah. So individual is in a relation to my incident and we were talking about want to see a contact card. So I will add additional properties to my individual 
instance, which is business partner ID and address ID. And for these, of course, you also require mock data. Yeah? Up to here, we just had um, the individual specific mock data. Now let's just, this is also prepared, just add additional mock data for my um, individual an entity. So this now fills the two additional properties. <clears throat> The next step is having done that, um, quickly have, have a look at my individual entity, whether everything is in place as expected. Individual, so we have now here these two additional properties. So, and um, we need to incorporate them. We need to now make the relation between this individual entity and the business partner entity for this. Um, we do this also on DB schema level. We add here also the using statement on top. So we say now we want to use from our imported CSN definition of my business partner API, um, some um, entities. Yeah, so at first we add this and then um, I said, I want to enhance my individual entity and we can do this and see this also by doing an extension. So I'm doing here an extend on my individual entity and add two associations, which is business partner and business partner address. Yeah, and they both make an association to the external representation of the service on the keys that we have just added here. So, and we can also immediately test that. Yeah. So if I go back to my individual, so let's just refresh <clears throat> and then select a specific individual. So we are here in the preview of our individual entity and I will just select a specific and then do an expand, for example, on business partner address. And we see now here my individual and um, my individual entity shows now the business partner address. <clears throat> okay, so um, that basically works. Now we said we want to <laughs> visualize that information on the UI. Uh, for that, we will add a um, another uh, annotation. In that case, um, I will add it to uh, the common CDS file here in the SOV folder. So there is usually you place annotations that um, have a reuse aspect. Yeah. So, for example, if I want to, if you want to use a contact card. Annotation, I might be adding it here and then use it in different pages or different UIs uh, defined on top. I would just copy and paste quickly because time is running short a bit. So I'm again doing this annotate individual and this time adding a communication contact annotation, providing some properties which point each of them to properties of my newly defined um, associations. So via the business partner, we display the name and uh, via the business partner address, we get the additional information from the business partner address entity to be also shown in, in the card. So this is not a contact card annotation what we have to do now is also to, de to define on the UI where it has to be shown. For that, I go back to my annotation. See this one, maybe let's close some of the other tabs to make it a bit more, a bit better. Here's again now my top level annotation CDS file inside my app. And I go to the header facet. We said we want to see the contact card in the header section of my UI. Uh, we have this one facet already shown. 
And I just add here another reference facet. Let's quickly do that. Reference facet and uh, as a target, we say in this case, we follow the association because we know it's not defined in the entity, but we have to retrieve it via the association. And then you see LSP also offers me the information here. What is missing is the, we can give it a, a, a label, of course. <clears throat> Save it. And then refresh. <clears throat> So now we have here this, ah, okay, there was a small typo, I fear. Yeah, the brackets have to be closed. <clears throat> and we have here this, this card, and if I click it in, it gets the information shown. So the last and the final step would be, um, to switch this now to Asana Cloud. How are we in time? Stefan, how's, where are we with questions? So there are six minutes left and at the moment, no open questions. Then I would quickly do the trick to switch to Asana. Um, I have a detailed explanation in the exercise, what are the prerequisites? So you have to, you have in, order to be able to consume the business partner of an Sohana cloud system, um, you need to have inbound communication arrangement uh, in your Sohana tenant in place. Yeah, so you need this to create this communication system and the communication arrangement. I have a link on that uh, also in the, in the last exercise. Um, then a technical user that is also created in the course for the inbound com communication needs to be available and the data that you define there has to be then filled into this default environment JSON. So we can make usage of this in a local setup. This would be the environment variables that are um, assigned to the, uh, to the running service that is deployed in the cloud. Uh, but we can also make use of this here and uh, the technical user and its pa password and also the endpoint of your OData API would just have to be added in here. What I will do now is uh, we'll just drag and drop a, a definition um, so we can make use of that without hopefully showing you the credentials. So, okay, that worked. And um, the last thing is I also in this, I have to enable that. So in the package JSON of the, of the service de definition in the CDS requires section, I enable my additional API business partner model by removing um, the credentials here. And the last thing I have to do is since we, and I wish I had more time, this is a bit short now. What I also have to do is I have to add some custom query handlers because the external calls that go to uh, Sohana Cloud, um, they have to be catched because now we switch from the mock mode now to a real mode where we really fetch the data from Sohana Cloud. And for that in the incident service JS handler that is also in the test resources folder, we have these additional handlers here defined. So here we see this uh, CDS connect to the API business partner definition that is defined in the package JSON. And then on the read of the business partner and business partner address, we basically call um, the external service handler and pass the transaction on. And there's also some additional lo logic required because we do uh, we do in this scenario calls from our internal V4 um, entities and do an expand on the business partner and business partner address entity. And for that, there is an additional handler defined here, which is a bit experimental. 
um, because we all we still um, Cup still has to provide full support for for draft here. So this is basically the recommendation to make usage of this now for display only, but to see to show that this basically works. I just replace my uh, custom query code I have defined in here with the one that is enriched. It has these additional definitions and then hopefully if I refresh to UI, this Erika Musterfrau should disappear and real s data should be shown or it fails. This is of course Murphy's Law now. Let's just check business partner. Maybe we have bad luck and the uh, thing is not available. This can be. Um, in a dry run, of course, it, it worked. <laughs> you can also check the open SAP course from CUP in the session four. This is again explained in detail. So my colleague David Kunz has shown how this S4 integration into CUP can be done if you need more information details and also the query capabilities that, uh, uh, that the uh, cloud application programming model has. It, with regards to uh, SOHANA cl cloud integration, you might find additional resources there. Okay, so the last step didn't work, but 98% uh, up to here were successful. I'm happy and I hope uh, you, you, you got a lot of information, a lot of yeah, valuable information. I encourage you to fork the repository, so I bring it up again. Um, so that you can um, that you can just uh, also have it a go for yourself. Yeah. So this is the repository with all the things that I've shown to can be rehearsed from you. <clears throat> okay, that would be it for my side. So we have a minute left for for questions. <laughs> And I wonder where my Zoom window is, is because I don't okay. see the positive feedback. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we love, of course, feedback. Yeah. So if you have any feedback, either via the SAP community channels or directly, I don't know whether you're allowed to speak up. So I thought you could also speak up in this session, but it was, of course, okay also to do, to do is via chat. So, thanks, Christian yeah. and uh, Stephen. Yes, um, so, it was really great session and then wonderful tips and tricks. And then, what is uh, possible with the all the standard templates and everything? It was really great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the feedback. Can this <clears throat> window be copied, or once you're going to send us link for this? The chat you should have yeah. Mm, yeah I, I i can do so you have the you should have the link also in the sap community event um uh just let me chat the recording itself will be available on the sap community page and mm -hmm. a youtube page in about two days um i can resend that link in the chat as well yes okay uh, just, uh, was so focused on the session. I'm searching for the chat. Ah, there it is. Okay, so here's the link to the repository. So I recommend to do a fork asset. Then you can just push pull if you have own GitHub.com account. Then you just have have, have have it in there, and then just can play around and uh, have fun. Hopefully. <clears throat> All right, everyone, it looks like we're just about a minute over. So thanks everyone for participating and thank you so much, Christian and Stefan for presenting on this topic. You're welcome all together and have a nice day and evening. Bye-bye.